I okay there. Can you see me okay? I can see you just fine. Hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Manu. I can see you as well. Uh, hello, Professor McGuire. How are you? I'm well, Hi. thanks. Thank I you. think we have we have our attendees starting to come in, which is great. And um, I just want to make sure that I'm going to put your name panel in so people can see your name. And if other uh, panelists, uh, Leela and Norman, uh, if you also want to um, go ahead and put your video on, now would be a great time. And hi. <laughs> Hi, Victoria and Aaron and Alance and Amanda. Hi. Hi, Angelo. <laughs> Hi, Cyrus. Hi, Demetrios and Gold and Greg and Isabella. Hi, Lisa and Lori and Luca and Michelle and Manal and Radhika. Hi, Ravi and Sunday and Sylvia and Thomas and Tosin and hi anyone prospective or incoming students that are um, joining us via recording. I'm Associate Professor Nicolette McGuire, and I'm our Associate Dean for Student Engagement, as well as our Associate Director for uh, Preclinical Education and Faculty. So I just want to welcome you all here for our um, webinar featuring our student ambassadors. So um, as you might know already, student ambassadors are around to assist our prospective students and our incoming students mm -hmm. uh, as well to understand some of the important aspects um, of the program and what it's like to be in medical school from the perspective only of someone who understands that well being a student themselves <clears throat> and really wants to has a drive to help you succeed in the early stages of medical school. Um, OEM is really serious um, about support for our medical students. I've also invited um, our OUM student associated student association members or UMSA um, members, um, Jess Bell and Janaid Minhas, to give us a little bit of information about the student association. And Janaid will also talk, um, give us a little bit of information about the PR support program. But we'll start off with um, our student ambassadors. I'm so pleased to have Wheela and Norman and Phoeba and uh, Manu here with us today and you get the benefit because these individuals um, volunteered to be student ambassadors and have been in their roles about a year now so they're very well experienced in supporting you. Um, I'm going to ask them a series um, of questions for you to get to know them a little bit better and also for um, you to have your questions answered so if you do have something that you would like any individual um, student ambassador to answer or the student ambassadors to answer as a whole, you can go ahead and type your question in the Q&A box and we'll take some time to answer those um, as we're able to. So I want to start um, with Wheela first because you're kind of up, up in the top corner um, of my screen. So Wheela, would you introduce um, yourself to uh, the attendees of our webinar today? Um, thank you very much, Professor McQuire. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Wheeler uh, Lima, and I am from Samoa. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wheeler. Uh, Norman, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Professor McGuire. Uh, my name is Norman, and I am currently based in uh, Toowoomba, Queensland, in Australia. And uh, I'm currently partway through my second year, and um, I'm hoping by the end of this year, beginning of next year, I'll start my clinicals once I've passed my um, preclinical exam. Thank you. No problem. No sweat for you. <laughs> no sweat. <laughs> Fiba, would you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. I'm Fiba. I live in Sydney, Australia. Um, I'm in my third year, a um, couple of SBMs away from starting my clinical rotation. And boy, what a journey it's been. Um, uh, looking forward to talking to all of you. Take care. Thanks, Fiba. Uh, Manu, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Manu Baines. I'm based in Perth, Western Australia. I'm uh, finally a medical student. I'm uh, completing my last core rotation. I have two more electives before I graduate. Looking forward to help you all. Thank you. Thanks, Manu. Uh, Elizabeth. 
Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Elizabeth. I'm here in the US and I have finished all my clinical rotations. I have taken my step one, which is our US boards, has that, praise the Lord. And I'm <laughs> sitting for step two and planning to apply for a US residency in the fall. So Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a medical student. Sorry, I had to run away from the children. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so, um, well, I was a nurse practitioner. I'm still am a nurse practitioner and a nurse before that. For for now, I've been a nurse practitioner for 12 years. And I actually was pre-med when I got out of nursing school, but then went to the nurse practitioner route because of life and things that happened. So it kind of just kept pulling on my heart. You know, the Lord was just saying, you need to go back. And so I looked into it. I looked into many, many, many times but it just didn't work out or it was not financially feasible. I couldn't do it and work and pay my bills. So, and this is, that's why I went to OUM because I could work and pay for school at the same time. So that's kind of why I was specifically attracted to OUM and why I um, started medical school. Something I wanted to do for 20, you know, well, I won't say 20, that's, that makes me a little old, but maybe like 15 years. And I'm so glad it's coming to fruition now. Yeah. I think that's a common story amongst OUM students, and we're really glad to see you just almost at the very end of your training. That's great. Uh, Norman, would you like to tell our attendees a little bit about your background? How did, what's your journey of as a medical student been like? Yeah, so far it's been really good. I I, I saw a question in the, in, the, in the chat that asked about our sort of our background, and personally, I came in with a Master's of Biomedical Science, so my route was pretty much uh, clearly a PhD route in the eyes of my supervisor. But after one whole year being in the lab, um, it wasn't as fun as I thought it would be. Um, and I really craved that personal, uh, interpersonal um, interactions. Um, so that's why loving science, but still wanting a, a more interpersonal connection with people, um, I decided to you know, um, go for mid school. And I have to say so far, what whatever I've been learning has been, um, very interesting and it's it kind of re-sparked my interest in the sciences because to be honest when I was doing my research it was all fun and it was all great but I didn't really see I couldn't really see the practicality of you know just learning about staff warriors and you know I'm sure there are there definitely are uh, applications to what I did but I couldn't find that passion in myself whereas um going through med school and um the, the course content at the moment uh, it's really really sort of um re-stimulated my interest in studies. Um, so yeah, it's been enjoyable so far. I don't think I, I don't think I knew that uh, Norman and I had a pretty similar experience. That's why I ended up as a professor in a medical school because I was also a bench scientist and I was like, I'm not sure this will be applicable and actually change lives. So I'm really, I'm really glad that you made that decision and that you're here. Um, you are great. <laughs> Eva, would you like to tell um, our attendees a little bit about your journey to becoming a medical student? Okay, just want to make sure that was me, right? Yeah, well, I must say, Dr. McGuire, you actually enrich our lives very well with the courses that you teach. So <laughs> great job there. Um, so my, my, my background is in computer science and mathematics, and, you know, I wanted to do uh, med school and, and be a doctor, forensic um, pathologist, um, when I finished high school, but I never pursued it, similar to a lot of other people here due to several factors. Um, so, you know, it was, at the time, it, it seemed that it was good to go into IT, and I did that, and I, I you know, I was a code monkey programming, and I, I did not like sitting behind the machine. So I thought maybe, you know, have to have that more interaction um, because I'm a people person. I went and did a business degree. So that was a research degree. Um, I've, you know, been working in that interactive role for the last 13 plus years as a uh, business analyst. Um, but, you know, it still didn't tick my box. So here I am at the age of 40. Um, Starting med school, um, started med school in my late 30s. Um, maybe that was my middle life crisis, but, um, you know, I don't regret it. It was like the best move. I'm a, a single parent and I've got two kids that I take care of and I work full time and I'm studying. It's nuts. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I think I'm just abnormally normal. 
So that's my journey and I'm loving it. I hope you love it too. Um, it's so funny to think of you like maybe sitting behind a computer and doing coding because you're so personable and, and empathetic. So I'm glad <laughs> you chose this too. COVID and I'm still behind the computer, like, <laughs> surrounded by monitors. <laughs> so yeah, I'd rather be out there taking care of sick people, to be honest. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Manu, would you like to tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah, my journey um, has been, you know, quite similar to a lot of my other colleagues. So I started off in healthcare, so I didn't, I didn't have a coding or software background, fortunately. Uh, so I started off in uh, nursing. So I've always worked with patients. Um, then I kind of stepped up the ranks within uh, the healthcare field. I actually uh, got a degree in podiatry as well. Um, then I worked uh, in healthcare management for a few years. But you know, I had this. Uh, um, kind of longing to go back to clinical. Um, and I had this sort of lifelong dream of becoming a doctor. Um, and, you know, OUM just came at perfect time. Um, a colleague of mine who had already finished uh, the program from OUM, he started working as an intern in the same hospital. So, and I had heard about OUM a few years prior to that. So, you know, meeting him and kind of discussing with him about OUM and his journey, you know, that really helped. And, um, and, you know, I'm really hoping that, you know, I'll be able to sort of contribute in um, making people some life changes as well and uh, really motivate them to kind of start their journey. I know you will. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of people have this like this lifelong dream of being a doctor and it's like having a dream is one thing, but like making it a reality is something different entirely. And we'll get into that. But I think that this experience of like having this nagging feeling that just won't go away. And the only thing that you can do is just like follow your path and follow your dream, whatever it takes. And I've definitely like seen you move through that. And it's great to see. Uh, Wheela, tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a medical student. Thank you very much. So um, for me, I have been a registered nurse in the TTM hospital for about eight years. So at the surgery and emergency department. Um, and from there, uh, I moved to teach in our local uh, university as a nursing lecturer in order to help me balance time with, with work and study. So um, the passion that I had um, when I was in the clinical area I started to have the interest uh, to join a medical school and to become a doctor. So that's my journey as a medical student. Um, thank you. And you're like this close as well. <laughs> Just like all, almost at the finish line. That's yes. great. Thanks, Leela. Um, I'm going to just like let Jess and Janaid answer this too, because I think their stories are are unique also and, and worth hearing. So Janaid, do you want to tell the um, attendees what your journey has been to becoming a medical student? Hi, everyone. My name is Janaid. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student with OUM. Um, so my background was quite similar to a lot of the panelists' background. Um, I had a background in nursing, and then I did my master's in public health. Um, got into academia, um, became a sessional tutorial teacher and realized that perhaps this is not where my career ends <laughs> um, and still was quite passionate about clinical care and being involved um, in clinical medicine um, and wanting to make a difference. Um, so hence, I decided to kind of look around and see, you know, if there was a medical school that could suit my needs. And OEM seemed to have popped up in a magazine that I was... Um, that, you know, that highlighted, um, you know, its program and um, I applied and um, yeah, fast forward four years and here I am. Um, it's been a very incredible journey. Um, but, you know, what's really helped me is my experience that I gained throughout my nursing career and my clinical experience um, has really kind of um, helped me in my clinical phase of the degree, I must say, it's been invaluable. Um, but yeah, so I'm also, um, since since joining OU, uh, OUM, I've become part of the OUMSA pro, um, program, and I'm also part of the peer support program, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, thank you. Thanks, Janine. Jess, you want to answer this question too? Is that okay? Hello? 
I think you might be stuck on mute. Maybe I'll, when we get to the end, when you, oh, you can go ahead. I've got it. <laughs> I just had to trace back because I was on the panel face. <laughs> That's but, good. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so me, I was a I was a dental nurse to start with for a few years, and then I moved into paramedicine. Um, I've been a paramedic for fourteen years. Uh, I had I have two children, a two and a four year old. So I had my four year old, and I was at home caring for her for two weeks when I realised I couldn't do it. <laughs> Just that. I needed some mental stimulation, so I signed up and did a master's of critical care. And uh, through that process, yeah, I just realized that I wanted to keep going and then become MD. So I just um, continued working at work, caring for children. And then I took on a uh, similar to Janaid, a couple of roles with Accult Academia, just teaching at our local universities in paramedicine. Uh, and then um, I had planned to kind of go the traditional um, route through uh, medical school and then I found out that I was pregnant with our second child who we did not plan to have. <laughs> and uh, yeah, life took a bit of a different turn. So um, the way it sort of worked for me was I was going to give birth to my second child and then uni would have started just a couple of weeks after that. So uh, that route kind of went out the window for me because of the time of day that you had to be there and then one of my colleagues from work um, he had studied with OUM and he's now a doctor at our local hospital he's currently specializing as a rural generalist so I had a, a long conversation with him about how he went through the process and and what he did so that inspired me to go uh, through OUM and um yeah, I had my baby attached to me at a lot of my lectures and <laughs> went through my first couple of years like that. And now I'm um, in third year um, along with everybody else and everything's going well so far. Fingers crossed it stays that way. And uh, just like Janaid, I'm a part of our student association uh, and also help uh, look after our student magazine as well too. Thanks, Jess. So there's a question. Um, from Radhika that want, she wants to know, or he wants to know, um, what are some of the struggles you have faced and how are you faring, did you fare with the first two years of being online? And maybe Norman, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this question to you first, <laughs> since you were just about, just about at the end of the first two years online. Yeah, no, definitely, thanks for that. Um, I, the, the struggles that I really faced were more, um, I guess because I'm more of a people person. So the difference is, uh, of course, being online that you don't have that um, sort of more personal relationship with people. That's why I do I do recommend that if people uh, do matriculate to OUM and they do join us, uh, make sure that you do attend the student conferences because um, that's where I met some um, some of my. Uh, cohort and some of my peers that um, it really helped put name putting names uh, to faces and actually getting to know them and actually uh, have created relationships out of those so definitely do attend those but other than that really with the content being online um, I wouldn't call them struggles they're, they're definitely more a plus than a struggle because uh, it really allows you the flexibility to you know um, manage your own study and I think that's important as well because you own your time and you own your own uh, success essentially because this is success is up to you now um, so I think definitely in terms of the struggles it, it's more a time management issue um, I'd say if there was any struggle um, uh, but yeah I have nothing but good thing to say about the program. Thanks Norman. Um, Pippa I'm going to ask you next you know what are some of the struggles that you've faced in Radhika also wanted to know, do you ever feel like you're missing out on anything compared to your peers studying at other universities? I'm Because I'm on my phone, I'm just trying to like flip through and find a new button. I, I did. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, uh, I, I actually... Um, I, started in Macquarie University and um, Junaid who's on the panel uh, I've met him at Macquarie University so I did one term um, of my 
you know, studies there and it was very challenging physically being um, there and um, similar to the experience that Jessica s has shared. So I'm not going to go into that. And so Junaid mentioned about OUM and I thought, okay, I'll just finish this one term. I'm already in it. Let me see how I go with this one term. And when that was done, I was like, Janet, I'm following you because I can't deal with this, you know, going there. So going to a physical university was a struggle for me. Um, but when I started at OUM, the content is immense, right? Um, we all joke about it's like drinking off a fire hydrant and it actually is. But you have the control to uh, make a study plan and figure out how you want to do this. And you need to be very disciplined, uh, very focused, and you need to have that grit to stick to that. So I don't see it as a struggle now, but in the first year, E Foundation was really challenging for me. Um, I used to find myself studying uh, after I dropped my kid for soccer. I'm sitting in the parking lot studying. I wake up early in the morning, 5 a.m., study till at 6. Then I get them ready for school, drop them to school, work, studying during lunchtime. So I was basically studying the whole time in the first year. I got my foundations um, pat down and make sure that I, I did really well because I didn't want to go back and restudy those. So my advisor had advised me to make sure that whatever you learn, you learn it very well. And that helped me with SBM. First few SBMs were a bit challenging. I wouldn't say struggle because by that time, I've kind of adjusted to that new way of learning. Now I'm on my um, third last SBM and my study plan and everything just naturally comes to me um, and I'm more focused in this. It, 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 it goes organically. So you may find it struggling at the beginning because you're just storming and then you're norm and then towards your third year, which I'm in, I think I'm actually performing now. But that's only like by experience that when I haven't even started my rotation, I'm pretty sure when it comes to rotation, it's going to be different challenges that I'm going to face, not per se about my study content, but more of managing personal life. So be ready for that challenge. Um, take it with a positive attitude and know that you will solve it. There is a way to it. Thank you. Thanks, Yua. I always am like encouraging students at the beginning of the program to just like be kind and gentle to themselves because they're just like, when you enter, like you're really excited and you want to do really well. And there's just like all of this information and you're like, whoa, it's just like, you can do this. Like you've got yourself this far, just like step back. Like you've got this, just be gentle with yourself and you're going to not end up having the study method and the study strategy later on that you had coming in. And I find that like with all of you and with our successful students, everybody's constantly adapting their study strategy all the time. And keeping that in mind is really important. Fiba, you wanna add some more? Go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> Junaid being the person who introduced me to OUM and he's a really good friend. We've been friends for five years. He's heard me call him late at night and sob. Sometimes, so there are times when that's happened where, um, you know, we just call each other and talk through, uh, you know, I've had friends that I've met at conferences as well that I call and I, I talk to. So uh, reach out to your friends, reach out to these people who are who also understand what you're going through. So, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thanks, Yuba. Sinead, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> um, I won't add too much. I mean, it is absolutely a, a high pressure demanding environment. You know, you, you're going to be overwhelmed initially. And I think um, FIBA did a great job. It's kind of saying it starts to kind of normalize and you, you, you kind of develop your own study strategies, your own way to kind of adapt through what works for you. And it's kind of a bit of a trial and error. And once you kind of get into your own kind of methodology of what works for you you kind of get into a groove and you start to cruise a little bit um not saying that you won't you know probably have some hurdles along the way um but overall you know you get to learn a little bit more about how to be more disciplined um but it's really important to i think whilst you're going through that process that you do reach out for help and ask for support there is support available there are students there who are willing to help to support you through the process 
if nothing else, just listening to you vent <laughs> about the struggles of being a medical student. Um, all of that is really important. I think if you have a strong social support system, you know, not just outside, you know, personally, but also at the university, it's going to help you. It's going to facilitate you to have a better outcome in medical school. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely. I think it, it you know, it, there's lots of trials and tribulations, but if you just keep going forward, eventually things will dissipate and things will, um, you know, and you'll, you'll get to where you need to be in terms of having success at medical school. Thanks. <laughs> um, there's a, Manu, there's a question about AMC and I know you're getting close to this. So I wondered if you wanted to answer this about, do you have to sit any extra AMC or NZMC exams? And is it difficult getting a position after? I know those are things you're, you're starting to think about now. Do you want to provide any information about that to Radhika and our attendees? Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of um, additional exams, um, yes, OUM is an international medical school. So in order for you to practice in, in Australia, and I believe in the US as well, you have to pass some board exams. So in Australia, uh, there's an exam called, um, there's two exams that are set by Australian Medical Council. So there's two parts to that exam. The first one is theory, and the second exam is an OSCE based. Um, but what's good about OUM is that they will prepare you for those exams because we have similar in-house exams as well. So we have a final clinical exam and we have an OSCE exam, which you must pass in order to graduate. So they kind of put you in that momentum um, and you know make you sort of ready for, for those AMC exams. Uh, once you've passed those exams, um, then you'll be able to graduate, do your AMCs, which are very similar. Um, once you've cracked all the exams, then um, next step is to look for internship opportunities. Um, there are hospitals uh, where OUM graduates are already practicing as interns. In fact, I've got a very good friend who's uh, just been accepted as an intern here in WA in one of the private hospitals. Uh, so there are options that are that already exist, um, and there are options um, in the eastern states as well, I believe. Now, with the AMC, what you have to understand is there are two types of registrations. Uh, so you have limited registration, which you can get after passing the AMC MCQ, and there's a general registration, which you can get after passing the AMC clinical exam as well, which is the OSCE based exam. But an alternative pathway does exist in, for those individuals that are not able to pass the AMC clinical exam for general registration purposes. They have an alternative option called workplace based assessment program as well. So um, you know, once you are, uh, once you've completed your internship and in order for you to get your general registration, you can actually opt to work in those hospitals that do offer WBA, complete that one year program in order to get yourself a general registration. So it's a slightly complicated process, but um, if you uh, seek guidance from someone who has done it before, or maybe from student mentors or from the faculty, uh, they'll be able to provide you some clear guidelines on that. Thanks, Manu. Um, we I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about the clinical experience in Samoa because you've done your clinical rotations there and all OUM students um, get an opportunity to go to Samoa and get really excellent hands-on clinical experience. But maybe you could tell um, our attendees a little bit about what that what those clinical experiences have been like for you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McGuire. Um, during my clinical rotations, I had the opportunity to uh, do all my clinical rotations in the tertiary hospital here in Samoa. And um, I would say that um, there's a lot of uh, hands-on um, um, practices. And you get to, I got to clap patients um, from the emergency department um, towards, um, did a lot of procedures, um, by myself and with supervision as well. Um, and um, a lot of people are there because since uh, Samoa have a very shortage um, doctors and it's a, I believe it's a worldwide um, um, issue as well. But with Samoa's hospital, you get to see one doctor, one senior doctor, and a lot of medical students and uh, or junior doctors as well. So as a medical student, I had to do a lot of um, um, things that doctors should be doing um, because of the shortage. 
um, they have utilized us to assist with the with these doctors to did a lot of operations, um, seeing a lot of patients and had to discuss with all of them uh, what their next management and next diagnostics will be. So I, I would say that I have learned a lot um, from being a medical student here in Samoa. And um, I believe um, there's, a, an, um, there's an elective um, four weeks uh, mandatory that with OUM. And um, I would love to assist and help um, with anyone um, um, getting to come here in Samoa in the future. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Leela. I have another question for you too. Sylvia has asked a question um, that she's wondering if it's possible to work well in OUM. And I know you've had the experience of, of working well whilst being a medical student because you your position was just needed in Samoa. You needed to continue to work. But maybe you could talk a little bit about that experience, you know, how is that what you would recommend that students continue to work um, in medical school? And what was that experience like for you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor McQuire. So, um, hi, Sylvia. Uh, I believe um, you ask about um, possibility to work while work, uh, while in OUM. So, with my background, um, I've been working since um, studying as well, and um, I think um, we all have that. Um, Definition we, we, with the first question as well with struggles, and I think we have uh, way different uh, definitions of struggles and trying to balance everything. And um, I was working full time and have four children as well, and being with OUM and had to learn online. I think the best uh, advice for you is to um, have that time management and be on top of your studies and trying to balance everything up on your own. And as Viva and Junaid mentioned that e-foundations and SBM is hard, but having to balance everything and trying to attend live classes as well um, is all uh, doable because I was one of them. <laughs> um, I never missed a, an SBM class. And I would say that I was working full time and study as well. And yeah, I would say that that can be doable. And um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Vila. Um, Vila was just mentioning eFoundation and SBM, which is part of our one side of our curriculum. Those of you who are incoming or who are prospective students will be taking um, our newer course, which is called Med Sciences. But I have to tell you that it's no less rigorous than anything that our student ambass current student ambassadors have had to do. Um, maybe Elizabeth, I might ask you the same question. I mean, what what was your journey like working in and studying? Is that something you would recommend, or what would you what advice would you give to people who are considering that? Yeah, um, I worked full time as a nurse practitioner, so um, but I did like four tens, and so I had three days a week where I was off and could kind of catch up, and I did. Usually it plugged into my live sessions, but sometimes I get out of work late and that's the nice thing. All the, all the sessions are recorded so you can go back and listen to them again. If you're not able to attend, of course, you're going to get some things from the live lecture, be able to engage, ask questions a little bit better if you're obviously there. And then there's some courses that you actually do have to participate, like you have to like show up. So, um, which they'll alliterate that at, at the time, um, when that's appropriate, but, uh, I think if you're determined and you don't mind not having a social life and, you know, just not getting sleep, I think I averaged two to three hours of sleep for all the work days. And then I got a little bit more sleep on the weekends. Like I nap a lot. Um, but again, it kind of based on how quickly you absorb knowledge, how well that you can focus and study, how many other things that you have going on. So um, <laughs> I definitely was like very sleeping very little. 
but I was paying my bills and I was paying for school. So, I mean, I call that that accomplished, <laughs> not, not well rested. I feel like I aged a lot those couple, uh, two and a half years, but yes, you can totally do it. Um, but I would consider scaling back. Like I had another job where I worked like 90 hours a week. And I was like, I know I can't do that job and do school the way that I need to do it. So do you think about working something? Do you think about a job more that's like 20, 30, 40 hours a week? Because you're going to need to put about 30, 40, 50, depending on your type of student you are, of hours into school. So you're going to be having two full times. Just look at it as a full time job. Like you have to submit at least that many hours to probably successfully do the class and prepare yourself for your boards at the same time. That's my thoughts. So definitely possible, but where you can manage, um, we would re we would really recommend not working during the program, but obviously for some people that's not um, a reality or a way to kind of get through. Um, it's definitely easier if you don't have to have a job, not that it's easy any day that you take. Um, and also that it's, um, it's not recommended for students to work during their clinical years, because when you're on clinical rotation or on call, you're not able to control those hours to the extent where you would be able to have another job. So that's just something to, to keep in mind and to get in touch with OEM students if you want to know a little bit more um, about that. Um, I want to maybe ask just generally so we can get to know, you know, how you guys all ended up in this room with me here today. And probably you've met some of the um, attendees of this webinar already if they've uh, reached out to you or been connected through our admissions team. But maybe you guys can tell me, why did you want to become a student ambassador in the first place? Norman, do you want to talk a little bit about why you would venture to take your time volunteering when all of you already have so many responsibilities on your plate. So tell us, tell us a little bit about why you wanted to become a, a student ambassador, Norman. Uh, well, for me personally, uh, like I say again, I really do appreciate those interpersonal relationships and developing those kind of relationships. And also mainly because people were reaching out to me anyway, um, before the program was um, implemented. And I was. I found that I was more than happy to answer people's question because for me, I found I I thought that I found Jim in OUM. So, um, and I believe in the program and what the program can do for me. So that's why whenever someone approached me and they they say like, "Hey Norman, I'm in this situation, not too dissimilar to mine." Um, I was like, "Look, um, yeah, uh, let me help you with um, the OUM and everything else that you needed to know." So when when the program came up and they asked someone to apply and I read the description I was like wait a minute I'm already doing that so I might as well have an actual title um, attached to it so I think even moving forward after say we finish this uh, program and the new student ambassadors come I'm, I think I'm still going to be actively doing this anyway because you know why hide it you know if someone wants to uh, come to me to, for information regarding um, OUM I'm more than happy to provide it so that's why I'm here. Thanks, Norman. Pivo, why did you want to be a student ambassador and what, what has that been like? What kind of interactions have you been having with our prospective and incoming students? Um, you know, I had a unofficial student ambassador at the time, Junaid, who's in the panel today, who was the reason why I discovered OUM and I'm here. And I thought if I can add value to another person who's thinking about studying medicine and if I can inspire them in any way shape or form then I'm happy to do that so I as being a student ambassador for the last year and uh you know being in part of one of these sessions earlier uh someone who attended actually reached out to me outside and got in touch with me through LinkedIn and who also lived in Sydney it, you know it turned out that person was working in a place that I worked before as well so um, you know, we, you know, and he, he, it was his first year and he was just talking about studying. So I find that, you know, you might just be like a drop in the ocean, but you can still make a difference. And so it's just kind of giving back to that, what, what you received in, in some way, pay, you know, pay forward, I suppose. So that's what, that, that's what drives me um, about this role. And I'm happy to share my experience. Um, in, in little ways I could. Thank you. Thanks, Pupa. Manu, what about you? Tell us a little bit about your, your drive and experience in, as a student ambassador. Yeah, so um, look, as I, uh, as I was um, 
uh, telling you guys earlier that I had a colleague that uh, had worked, had started as an intern in the same hospital, who had gone through OUM. And I feel like um, there were a few years when I was um, sort of contemplating starting med school, going through OUM. There were a lot of questions in my mind. Um, and when I met this gentleman at work, you know, who was working as a nurse the week before, and now he's starting as an intern. And I'm like, which med school did you go to? <laughs> You know, within a week, you've become a doctor. He was like, oh, no, no, this was a long time ago. I was in Melbourne and I was studying through OUM and I went to Samoa to do my intern year and stuff like that. So that's how I, I sort of discovered about the school. And, you know, really valuable advice uh, that he provided. And I felt like, you know, because all these years I had a lot of skepticism and I wanted a lot of my questions answered, but there wasn't really, you know, a program you know, such like this, which existed back then. Um, and I would have really loved to sort of, you know, get in touch with someone um, who has, who had, you know, probably been through the journey, uh, like, uh, like that gentleman at work. Uh, but there weren't too many people. So, um, and when I started the course as well, obviously, as the other guys have mentioned, uh, as well, you know, there are some challenges that you go through, and you develop your sort of ways of tackling problems, and you develop, ways through smart work and hard work and all of that. Um, so I thought, okay, well, you know, I've developed some strategies now and I know how to conquer that problem. So maybe, uh, you know, I can help someone um, who probably won't have to reinvent the whole wheel. So maybe I can share some valuable advice. So, you know, basically stems from something similar that the other guys have mentioned. So nothing too unique about that, but I think it's important to um, realize that, you know, there are a lot of change, uh, a lot of challenges that you face and uh, conscious and consciously and subconsciously, you are developing strategies to, to tackle those problems. So I think it's important to kind of share those with people, um, not only to sort of, you know, make a difference in their lives, but it gives you that satisfaction as well. Thanks, Manu. Leela, what about you? What's been your experience so far as a student ambassador? Um, thank you very much. So I became a student ambassador because I wanted to encourage everyone that becoming a doctor is very hard, but consistent striving and hard work will get you there, as mentioned by um, a lot of the speakers um, before me. So I would encourage that all those readings and small steps, uh, and if you continue on with them, you will eventually get there. Um, we may have different ways of struggling while doing school at the same time and um, trying to earn money for your family. And, um, but we will all um, become doctors at the end um, after all the hard work. Um, I had a lot of prospective and current students on different stages of their journey contact me in any way. And I just love to assist and advise them um, in order for them to reach their goal to become doctors as well. So yes, um, thank you very much. Thanks, Mila. We're so appreciative of that. Elizabeth, do you want to just tell us a little bit about your experience as a student ambassador? Yes, um, I, well, I'm, I guess I became a student ambassador because I wanted someone to be real with me. <laughs> I mean, uh, I wanted to be able to be real with pay people about, you know, what's really going to take, you know, what am I, what is it really going to cost? Um, what's the real side of it? I don't need warm fuzzies. I don't need anything like that. Life is too real. <laughs> so I think that's one thing is just to be like someone to be sitting down and be like, yeah, this is, this is what it is. This is what it's not, you know what I mean? And um, just to kind of offer that to people and, and to be like the other people, just to hopefully be an encouragement. You can do it. You can get through it. You know, I'm living proof as of today, you know, <laughs> but, um, and the school is also trying to improve things to make it, the tracks easier to make people more successful. And, um, you know, we can say, Hey, you know, girl, you had, you weren't here when it first, you weren't here five years ago. So it's better. <laughs> So sometimes things like that is that, you know, you're seeing a university trying to improve things too. So, um, and uh, just, uh, again, to be a light in a dark place, because medical school seems to be a dark place. Sometimes it's awesome and you learn a lot and it's great, but it's a dark place. <laughs> so you need little flashlights and people with candles <laughs> to show you, hey, you can, you can do this. It's okay. Well, you're you're almost to the end, Elizabeth. What's your Thank what you. are your hopes? What are your plans for when you're all done?
Oh, I might have got cut off. So Elizabeth, because you're already like almost at the end, what's what are your plans? What are your hopes for when you're all all done medical school? Um, well, I'm planning in Jesus name that I'm going to go into surgery residency. So um, I, and if you're planning to go to the U.S., I mean, there's apps and different things that you can do to um, kind of figure out which which places are more IMG international student um, uh, friendly, so to speak. And also I talked with Dr. Boone, the dean of North America, and we're trying to get together a list of like you know, the programs that have taken OUM students and in what field. So things that are going to help make it easier, like, oh, they already have OUM students there. I can maybe go over there. So um, I'm planning to go into surgery, God willing, uh, general surgery. My husband actually is a first assist in surgery. He's been doing that 20 years. I'm like, I'm going to hire you and you're going to help me. <laughs> so um, uh, so that's what I hope I am as a secondary, though, because I'm a family nurse practitioner. I'm either planning also as a backup for family med or internal medicine. Thanks, Elizabeth. And Anonymous had a question about um, the position of OUM in terms of accreditation and OUM students being able to sit for USMLE. So you, Elizabeth has said the USMLE OEM students are eligible to sit. The USMLE were accredited by PASCU, which also ha now has uh, WFME accreditation. So um, you, if you are a US student, you will, you will be on the pathway to sitting USMLE. You will be part of USMLE. Prep if you're at OUM and you'll take the steps one and step two before your graduation. Uh, Wheela, you're almost at the end uh, as well. So what are your hopes, plans for when you're all done? Thank you so much. Um, so my plans at the moment are to, um, after graduation this May, I will come back and work in June and serve as an intern studying in June after graduation. And that will take me 21 months as a house surgeon. And after that, um, I will look into a fellow program in the emergency or internal medicine and to become a specialist in order to help um, people of Samoa. So those are my plans. And <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Wheela. Um, I'm going to, well, Mana, do you want to ask this question or answer this question before I go on? Is that okay if I put you on the spot? <laughs> I'll ask you that one too. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Is is the question about what my plans are after finishing? Yeah, yeah, after. yeah. yeah no. So <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of on the tail end of uh, finishing my course. I'm doing my final core rotation in uh, community medicine, and I've got two more electives uh, lined up after this. So I'm hoping to finish all my rotations by middle of August or end of August. And then my plan is to do the in-house exams like final clinical exam, um, OSCE exam, um, be able to graduate, apply for AMC, at least pass the AMC one in order for me to start or get accepted into an intern program, um, hopefully next year. Um, and then, um, you know, plan after that is to apply into uh, basic physician training. Um, after completing the internship and uh, <clears throat> my my goal is to become a, either a general physician or uh, complete um, you know uh, professor mcguire would, li would like this uh, like endocrinology uh, as well so after doing the basic physician training i'll see if i can get my hands into the advanced training into endocrinology so that's that's my medium and long-term sort of goal i'm i'm yeah that's why i wanted you <laughs> <laughs> to say that <laughs> I am excited for that for you. Yeah, um, you. <laughs> um, I want to turn the floor over um, to Jess and Janaid, um, just briefly for those of you who are students who are incoming for the 23-2 um, cohort, um, for Jess to tell you a little bit about UMSA or OUM Student Association and, and how you can join that. So Jess, I'll turn it over to you um, just to give a little bit of information about that. Sure. So uh, I am serving as the president this year. Uh, Janaid is our advocacy officer. And then we've also got um, Jason as well as Garrett. So Garrett looks after finances and Jason um, helps out with membership. So when you uh, enroll with OUM, you can register to be a part of the OUMSA as a member. So that gives you certain benefits with um, AMSA, which is the American Medical Students Association. So we're a chapter of them. You don't at the moment pay any fees for us, but you will pay the fee to AMSA. So it's $75 for the four-year term or $35 each year. 
I would definitely encourage you to do this so that take the cheaper option, which is the 75, which covers your degree. So just having that membership alone gives you 50% off um, the platform up to date, which you will use quite regularly through your studies with OUM, particularly when you um, come to second year and you start doing your SBMs. So that platform alone in Australian dollars is about $280 a year for a membership with that. So your AMSA OUMSA membership gives you 50% off of that. So you're already saving like $140 when you just paid $75 for a membership and that's every year. So if you then use up to date, so I've used it two years in a row now. So that was a $280 savings for me minus the $75. So I'm still $210 better off at the moment. Um, there are a lot of benefits like outside of that, uh, particularly if you're in the US, you can attend um, all of their conferences over there. They're holding one in Arizona this year in June. So you can attend that. Um, they also have the opportunity for some scholarships and things like that that we can be involved in. Um, a couple of like simulator things that you can be involved in online. Um, you know, creating posters. You can actually even apply to work for them in a similar fashion that you, you would apply for a role if you wanted to be an OUMSA delegate. So our role on a university level is uh, basically we're here for the students. So if there's any sort of burning questions that you have, any issues that you'd like raised with faculty, we will advocate for the students and take that and talk to OUM faculty and then come back with an answer for the students. So students are always able to reach out personally, but where this is more of a benefit is you'll have more voices rather than just one and you get an answer for everybody rather than just one answer for one student and then maybe another student then having to um, raise that again themselves and faculty are dealing with the same problem a second time over. So we do encourage everybody to register and then send us an email, um, talk to any uh, all of us about your issues and, and we're always there to advocate. We, we spend a lot of our weekends doing stuff like this and helping out. We'll hold, you know, polls to get your, your thoughts on things. We're always coming up with programs that better the university and give our students more opportunities. So the Student Ambassador Program was one of those. Um, you know, and that really also helps all of you as individuals, but helps our students in terms of elevating their, their CV and giving them life experiences that are going to benefit them when it comes to getting a job. So we're working on other things like, um, you know, mentor programs and things like that. We have the student magazine, which I encourage you all to have a look at. You can just search it on Google, the OUM student magazine through issue. It'll come straight up. It's also on our OUM website. Um, we're up to, our, I think, our fourth issue now, and we always have um, a profile from a student, from a graduate, from a faculty member. So you can learn a, bit, a lot about our university, um, the life of our students, how we go through getting uh, internships, how, how our graduates went sitting their exams. So there's a lot of information for you there as well, too. So I'd encourage you to use those. They're also a platform for our students to, to write their own pieces, whether they be creative poetry, a day in the life of, all those sort of things as well too. We've got our OUM student um, conference coming up later this um, month in May. So if you can afford to come, I definitely would advise you to buy a ticket and come along and join us. It's a great opportunity to meet all of us, but also network with all of the faculty. We've got some of our clinical coordinators there, you know, some of them work in intern recruitment. So these are fantastic opportunities to get to know these people. We also have a lot of stalls and uh, interactive games with the OUMSA. We're going to have about four games running where you can win stethoscopes and otoscopes and suture packs and um, we're giving out awards. So it's just a really great opportunity to come meet everybody um, and have that social aspect, which sometimes we lack a little bit. But as everybody has told you here today, the minute you enroll, have a look at everybody that's in your class, send them an email, create a WhatsApp group, stay in touch. A lot of us will get together a couple of times a year, you know, um, mid-year around Christmas, just catch up for dinner, uh, get to know each other that way. And then we have our own online study groups just through WhatsApp. And um, 
I've, you know, made a couple of really great friends and, and we talk multiple times a day. I probably speak more to them than I do my family, <laughs> just online. So <laughs> I think you can create some really lifelong friendships um, here as well too, even though it is online. So um, I encourage you all to enroll. I'll put the um, link there for you uh, and you can just press in, have a look through AMSA. But again, you can find it yourself just through searching at, um, the American Student Association and just put international membership and it comes straight up if you ever need to find it. Otherwise, to contact us, which you can do at any time as well too, even if you haven't matriculated yet and you have a question, we are O-U-M-S-A at O-U-M uh, dot Thanks for that. I'll hand it over to Janaid. Thanks, Jess. I just want to um, commend OUMSA because the Student Ambassador Program is really the, the brainchild of the OUMSA, and um, this program was developed in collaboration between the university and, and UMSA. And uh, Jess is now in her second year as being an officer um, in UMSA, and uh, I just want to commend you personally for, for your um support and your um, your uh, work on this program. And if you guys want to know a little bit more um, about the um, student ambassadors that you've met today, you can also read about them in the student magazine, which is available from our website, which Jess is the, the editor of as well. So we're really serious here about student support. We really believe in the student support system as a really strong factor of success. Um, in medical school. And so I wanted to give um, Janaid, although he's an, an UMSA officer as well, just a little bit of time to, if he wants to provide some information about the peer support program and where to find some more information about that as well. So Janaid, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dr. McGuire. Um, yes, I am part of OUMSA, but I'm also part and kind of in part leading and the peer support program at OUM. So the peer support program kind of um, came out of an initiative and conversation that me and Dr. McGuire <laughs> started having at last conference. And I encourage everyone to attend the conference if you guys haven't registered yet. Um, we will have a peer support booth there um, and promoting our service. So we'd love to see you. So basically, it's part of the mental health and well being initiative at the university. Um, and it's basically student led. So um, students are actually paving the way for other students and their peers and sharing experiences also sharing um, insights of being a medical student and how you can navigate through this difficult journey of medical school. Um, and so we also have um, Dr. Brownie Tosopo, I'm so, sorry if I mispronounced his last name. Um, and, he's, and we have our faculty sponsored, which is um, Professor uh, McGuire, which is great. Um, and they all basically support um, a, a, a peer, peer support program um, and also allow us to kind of brainstorm more ideas and kind of lead the way for other students coming forward as as the program develops um, and as changes continue to happen at OUM. Now, I just want to quickly say that we have um, a new peer support email address. So those who want to contact us um, and maybe you wanted to have a confidential discussion about some things that, you know, personally, academically that you might be struggling with, um, it might be helpful, you know, to just kind of reach out. Um, I just want to mention some of the peer supporters name because I think it's important to acknowledge um, the, you know, the contribution they're making uh, in the background. So we've got Reet, she's a clinical student, um, and we've got Walter, um, Tasnia, Justin, and I'm also a peer supporter myself. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, our new peer support email address is peersupport at oum.edu.westernsamoa. So um, yeah, it's, we're, you know, we're a compassionate, empathetic bunch of people, um, and we'd love to be able to help you and um, where we can. And if we, we, we aren't able to help you, we're at least able to kind of liaise with faculty and staff to see what kind of support we can offer you guys. Um, yeah, I think I'll probably leave it there. Um, thanks, Dr. McGuire. Thanks, Sinead. I want to commend you for your work on that program, basically building it from the ground up and now making it what it is, which is a student-led um, initiative. It's not just one-on-one -on -one support. We also have like um, stethoscopes down, which is like a meetup for clinical students to kind of debrief and a number of other programs that our peer supporters are working on. So I just want to, I want to acknowledge you and the amount of work that it takes. And, and for all of you that are here today, like you're providing you know, your time, which is your most valuable 
asset and, and a really huge resource to the university. But this is a really great opportunity too for like leadership experience. And we really um, at OUM want to provide opportunities for excellent students like yourselves to, you know, have some opportunities for leadership and having visible positions in terms of how our university operates. So I want to I want to thank each of you for that. And I thought I would um, close our webinar today, just allowing each of you to give some advice to um, our attendees today who may be incoming students or prospective students. What advice would you give them about, you know, starting medical school or, or being a prospective student? What, what advice would you have for them about whether they should take the plunge and become a medical student? So FIBA, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay, if you, if you can... Um, make the touch screen work and get yourself on me. That's great. So please go ahead. Okay. So um, uh, when I wanted to follow Janaid, and um, I remember talking to him so many times about my motivation letter, and I actually did not know what to write on it. And um, it took me about six months to write it because I needed to be very sure that I'm I'm doing this um um, for real, uh, because I, you know, I, I do have a great job that pays amazingly well, um, probably what a clinician would get paid now. And for me, you know, starting off as an intern would mean like very low pay, which I wouldn't even get out of bed for, to be honest. So I needed to be very sure that I was signing up for something that I am going to put in my time, that I am going to be committed, that I'm not going to walk away halfway, draining all that money. And, and you know, and so Think about it very deeply. Save if you can uh, before you start your journey. That would alleviate some of the stress for you. And um, think deeply about your motivation uh, letter, your application to see if this is really what you actually want to do. You might Your life might be very great right now and you're going to go through uncomfortable phases. So you need that motivation to kick, your, kick up your bum to get out of bed and, and keep doing it. So that's one key advice that I would give you is that to make sure this is absolutely what you want, um, uh, you, you know, um, uh, and it's going to be painful, uh, but it's just a pain that you're willing to um, get through because at the end of it, it is going to feel like it's worth it. I already feel like it's worth it. Um, I know it's going to be struggle um, in the next few years for me and for my children. I'm putting them through this as well. Um, but it, you know, I feel that sense of satisfaction that it is worth it. So you need to be very sure about it. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Viva. Leela, what about you? What advice do you have? Thank you very much. So I advise all students that um, medical school is not easy, as they say, and we say as well, but working together in partners or small groups. Um, reading, searching, asking, attending live classes and ask questions, more questions. Seek help earlier and have the support from your family, husbands, wives, partners, etc. will get you there. And work hard and study harder. You have a lot of the very um, supportive and dedicated coordinators and professors and faculty from OUM that will impart their knowledge attitude and skills for your medical journey. And just picture yourself looking more beautiful and more handsome with that white coat. And I will end my uh, talk with saying all the best with your journey as a medical student and let God do the rest. Thank you. Thanks, Willa. Uh, Norman, what advice would you have? I think everyone's given pretty good advice, but um, yeah, for, for me, it's uh, just to remember, uh, like like Wheeler and Fiba has said, you know, it, it is difficult, and um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you ever need support. Like, like Jeanette said, we've got really good support around, and um, it doesn't have to be lonely. So definitely do that. But the next best thing that I can give is um, time management. So really have your time management uh, down uh, to a T. Um, you're gonna be needing that skill a lot. Thanks, Norman, Elizabeth. Yes, um, do it. Just jump in. Take the plunge. Don't, I mean, um, there's there's no perfect timing for anything. You're never going to have the money that you want to have. I'm not saying don't plan and be whatever, but don't let all those things stop you from finding a way to, you know, do something you wanted to do. I've wanted to be a physician for 15 years 
and I'm finally doing, I'm finally about to be one. So um, uh, am I poor in some ways? Yes, but I am much richer um, in all the others. And I'm from the people that I've met, from the knowledge that I've had that's enriched, already enriched my profession as a nurse practitioner. And, um, you know, I've reached more, helped more patients because I'm more knowledgeable and more educated. I, I, you know, the people that I've met along the way and how they've developed my skills and only that's only going to improve as I, as I go along. So that's the big thing is just do it. I mean, I'm not like advertising for Nike, but just get in there, jump in. The other thing Dr. McGuire already mentioned is be gracious to yourself because you're going to not do everything really well, <laughs> either courses or relationships or, you know, finances or whatever it is. Just be gracious to yourself. This is a very challenging process, but, um, you know, with support, with, you know, friends, family, with your colleagues, you know, you can get through this. It may not go as smoothly as you planned. It will probably not go exactly how you planned. That's also another thing, but um, you can stick to it and, and make it happen. So definitely do it. Thanks, Elizabeth. No time like the present. Manu, what advice would you have? Yeah, I would also say the same. Uh, just, you know, get out of your comfort zone, push the boundaries, be surrounded by the right people, be inspired by your role models, uh, look at the bigger goal, uh, bigger picture, what it's going to give you in the end, and just keep working. Thanks, Manu. I know that um, all of you here will join me in expressing gratitude to our student ambassadors for joining us today. Um, what you might not have known is that I did say these student ambassadors have been in this position for about a year, so they're just coming to the, the tail end of their service. And I just want to acknowledge from the bottom of my heart personally, but also from the university, how much we valued your expertise, your empathy, your time, your attention, the service that you've provided um, to the university and to our prospective students. Um, we don't have the two cohorts um, here that came in in July and the second in January that would have been that benefited most um, from your service, but I know they will join me um, as well in, in thanking all, all of you um, for the service that you provided and it's just been invaluable and thank you so much FIBA and Leela and Norman and Elizabeth and Manu. We just couldn't have gone through the last year with, without you and what um, you've done for us, so we really appreciate it. So if you'd like to get in touch um, with our student ambassadors, please reach out to your admissions counselor and they can support uh, that connection. We'll have some new um, uh, student ambassadors. Um, if you are watching this webinar, if you're here in person and interested in becoming a, a student ambassador, the information has been posted um, on Moodle for you to get a better sense of that. And also you can reach out to our student ambassadors if you're interested in what it's been like for them to be an SA. So thanks um, all of you who've attended uh, tonight for your time and attention. We've so appreciated sharing uh, our space with you and um, bringing you into the OUM community today. And we hope to see you as part of our community in the future. Thanks so much and bye for now. <laughs>